Hello, welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and in this episode we do Greece. Greece geography. Greek geography and uh, the beginnings of military power in politics. So we'll see how far we get. We're going to keep these into short bite size, try to get them around 20 minutes, and um, be awesome. Okay, so ancient Greece. Greek geography has two components to it, and you can see it if you're on the video uh, right from the pictures. If you go to Google Maps and take a look at Greece, you can see it as well. There's two things. There's mountains and the sea. And so we have to start talking about mountains. Mountains equal poverty. The Greeks are poor. When we start talking about the Greeks, the Greeks are poor. There are first really poor people. Even the Hebrews had a better geographic spot when they start than the Greeks do. Why? Well, because 90% of the land was useless for farming. It's mountains. And I know if you're in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, in the South Jersey, Pennsylvania area, you might go, wait, there's lots of flat land. But go out to L.A. L.A. is a great example of this. Glendale and parts of northern L.A. Malibu, where there's a mountain, then a flat piece of earth that you go through a tunnel. You get through, to get to Glendale from L.A., you go through a couple of tunnels, you go through the mountains, you pop out, and boom, you're on this flat valley. And I went to the famous cemetery that's there, and they have a lookout because you you overlook the whole thing. And you, you get up there, and you go to the church, and you look out over the valley, and it's all Glendale. It's all flat, and there's buildings, but surrounded on three sides by mountains. So it's this little area of densely lived people. And then there's the mountains. Well... In the modern world, we have tunnels. You could punch your way through the mountains. Anybody, any of you who ever have taken the Schuylkill know this to get out to Lancaster, to get out to King of Prussia where the land flattens out. You got to punch through those, those mountains. And you know there's always traffic on the Schuylkill. Why? Because it's a very narrow road. It's two lanes. And there's the river on your right if you're going out. There's a river on your right and a mountain on your left. And there's two lanes going east, two lanes going west, and that's it. There's nowhere else to put a road. And so the Greeks are poor because the lands that they lived in are these small flat areas surrounded by mountains. 90% of their land is useless for farming, and 98% of your economy is agriculture. It's farm. It's food. So what this also does is not only make the Greeks poor, but it isolates their communities because the mountains separate them from each other. Like, how do you get to Glendale without the tunnels? How do you get to Philly from South Jersey without the bridges? You'd have to take ferries. You'd have it be much harder to do. And so what the mountains do is cut people off. They isolate people. And this creates an I identity of autonomia, autonomy, of self-rule. Autonomia. Auto, A-U-T-O, no, N-O, mia, M-I-A, where we get the word autonomy from. The idea is self-rule. It's we make our own rules. I'm not going to listen to whatever rules from the people on the other side of the mountains want. We do our own thing here. It's like every, every, every midterm election, you get senators from the South saying, we don't want to be told what to do by New York or California, so you have to vote for us. You don't want to be told what to do by those elites, effete elites in New York with their New York values. 
California values. We do our own thing. Well, the Greeks have that idea. We'll make our own rules. We'll have our own culture. And you on the other side of the mountains, you do your own thing. So what this creates is the polis. P-O-L-I-S, which creates the identity. Now, the polis is the city, but it's more than the city. It's the city state. It's your identity. It's who you are. You're not Greek. You're Athenian. You're Spartan. You're Theban. You're Corinthian. You're not Greek. You speak Greek. You worship Greek gods, but you're not Greek. You're Athenian. You're Spartan. And these are the cities because you only have this small little area and a lot of the area has to be for food. So you have to live in a densely tight city and then go out to your farms. So this is our first urban people. Now, I know we talked about Babylon. And Babylon's a massive city. Yes, of 250,000 people, there is nothing like Babylon. Still, even now when we're talking about the Greeks, there's still nothing like Babylon. But most people in the Middle East don't live in Babylon. The Middle East had 5, 6, 7 million people, 10 million people in it. They, for the most part, lived in small towns, out of the way, in rural countryside of the rivers. They didn't live in Babylon. They didn't live in these big cities. They went and sold their goods in the big cities. And then they went back to their farms and their small little towns of 500 people. A thousand people would be a big place. 5,000 people was a city. That's why Babylon is like nothing else. And even for the Greeks, a typical Greek city is five to 10,000 people. Even Sparta. One of the most powerful of all the Greek cities never had more than 10,000 adult male citizens in it. Now, there were more people working, and we could, we'll talk about that when we get to the Spartans and all that. So it's a little more complicated. But the Spartans always have a population issue. They're a small people. The Athenians will have 300,000 people in their city. But maybe as much as a third of them were slaves. They weren't citizens. So you're talking 200,000 people. And if you split them in half, that's 100,000 men. And then you split that again for adults. So even in Athens, you might be talking, you know, 50 to 100,000 male citizens. Maybe at the most. So we're talking small places in comparison to, say, Babylon, Egypt as a whole. But Egypt doesn't have any major cities. This is our first urban place. These are people who want to live in cities, who like to live in cities. And they will define civilization from the Greeks on. To be civilized is to, to be sophisticated, is to live in a city. Is to not be rural. Is to not be country people, country folk. It's to be an urban living city person. And so the city becomes the center of civilization and most importantly trade because no city could survive on its own. They're too poor. They need too much stuff. They need food. They need supplies. They need stuff. So they have to trade. Now, of course, that gets us to a problem. How do they trade if they're surrounded by mountains? Well, that gives us the sea. Most of our cities are also connected to the sea because Greece is a peninsula surrounded by water on three sides. And the Greeks know they're not stupid. They know they need a connection to the sea. And the sea provides that connection. But that sea provides that connection to the Mediterranean Sea. Mediterranean, M-E-D-I-T-E-R-R-A-N. E A N again, M E D I T E R R A N E A N, the Mediterranean Sea. Once you're on the Mediterranean Sea, you could go anywhere that's connected by the Mediterranean Sea. That means you could go to the Black Sea, you could go to Egypt, you could go to Phoenicia, 
You could go to Lydia in modern day Turkey. You could go all the way to Spain. You go to the Atlantic and go up the coast to France, to Northern France, to the English Channel, to, to Britain. You can go anywhere. And so the sea provides that connection. So the second thing that we have to talk about is that the Greeks are our first ocean going people. They're our first people who take to the water and move. Now the Phoenicians do it too, but we don't really talk about the Phoenicians. They're our first people who do this, but the Greeks do it just as much. The Greeks are right behind them. Notice what the Greek myths are. Jason and the Argonauts, a bunch of dudes get on a boat and go places. Um, the Odyssey, a bunch of dudes get on a boat and go places. The Iliad, a bunch of dudes go, get on boats, go to Troy, stay there for 10 years, and then come back. Get on boats and come back. And so what you get is the rise of Greek cities outside of the Greek peninsula, Crete, in Magna Gracia, Greater Greece, which is southern Italy and Sicily, in the Black Sea, what is now the Ukraine, parts of Russia, and the Caucasus Mountains, what you get is colonization, which we've never had before. Right? The Egyptians don't like to leave Egypt. The Hebrews don't like to leave Cana. Even the Babylonians don't leave Babylon all that often. They don't want to go out to Spain and build a new Babylon. There are no new Babylonia in Portugal, but there are Greek cities. And to a lesser extent, there are Phoenician cities out there. Carthage being the most famous. Carthage is a Phoenician city in North Africa, where Tunisia is today, where Tunis is. And what this colonization does is it allows people to leave Greece to find better land for farming, to get richer. Just like people left Ireland and England and came to America, why they left Italy and came to America to get more land so they could be more successful. Well, if I'm a Greek, young Greek man living outside of Thebes in the north of Greece, I'm looking at the land going, I, all right, I have to save up a lot and buy a plot of land. Or I can go down to the docks, join a, join a group that's forming that are going to go out to Sicily where the land is much flatter and I'm guaranteed a plot there. I may have to fight some Sicilian natives who are already living there who will be upset if I try to take their land, but, I'll, but I'm Greek. I can do that. And so what colonization does is allow the culture to spread. And as that culture spreads, you get the success of the Greeks. They're still poor, but increasingly these cities are successful. The people are successful. Their civilization is on the move and on the rise. They're getting better. They're not Babylon. They're not Egypt, but they're not the Thracians either. They're not the Germanic war tribes in the forest. They're not the Gauls or what in the Bible, they're called the Galatians up out of France, who the Greeks look at and say, you don't live in cities. You don't have the rule of law. You don't have a lot of writing. You're barbarians. So the, the Greeks are separating themselves out from one group of poor peoples and trying to be part of the rich civilizations, Lydia, Babylon, Egypt. They're, they're the poorest of that group, but they're trying to be in it. The sea also allows, as we've talked about it a little bit, the connection to those older civilizations. Egypt, Persia especially, because the Persians will conquer Babylon, will conquer the Lydians. And that allows for trade because like Egypt has the most food and Greece needs food and knowledge. So Plato will tell us, Plato will who come along, the philosopher Plato will say, the Greeks never invented anything. They just improved on everybody else's ideas. And if they improved on other people's ideas, they improved a lot on the Egyptian ideas. They took a lot of Egyptian ideas. The Egyptian gods they took, like straight out. They said, oh, our gods are the Egyptian gods, but in a new form. And they invented a whole story where the Egyptian gods had a, they, they, the Egyptian god cosmology also has a god killer. 
And so the idea was they those Egyptian gods had to flee. This is also why the Egyptians represent them as half animal. It's, the idea is that they're humans, but they're in a, wearing a mask. So they fled to Greece. Ha ha. This is what the Greeks say, of course. They fled to Greece because it was awesome. And they hid out on Mount Olympus. And that's where we discovered them. Um, and we just called them Zeus and Apollo. We just called them Greek names. But they're really Egyptians. They're, they're like the same kind of gods. And there's a scientific word for how you do this, how you, how you connect your um, polytheistic gods to another culture's polytheistic gods. And the Romans will do the same to the Greeks because the Greeks, by, that, by the time the Romans come along, the Greeks are rich. And so they're like, hey, our Jupiter is like your Zeus. It's like, they're like the same. And it's a way of, for a lesser culture to show how cool they are with the superior culture. Now notice nobody at this point wants monotheism. They all look at the Hebrews and go, yeah, don't want that. We want polytheism. We have polytheism. We're going to have lots of gods. So we get Egyptian gods. We get Lydian coins. When they go to Lydia, when they go to what's called, I when they start to colonize a place called Ionia, I-O-N-I-A, which is the coast, the western coast of Turkey today. Um, and they meet the Lydians. The Lydians have coins. The Lydians have taken gold and platinum and have uh, standardized a weight and stamped them, printed them into coins, into a gold coin. And the Greeks went, oh, that's awesome. You mean I don't have to carry all of this? I had to, to, if I want to buy uh, a cart of barley, you mean I don't have to bring five chickens with me? I can just give you one coin? That's awesome. And so they take Lydian coins and they start using coinage. Uh, they push out weaker barbarian peoples, the Thracians, as we said, uh, this, who's ever living in Sicily, who's ever living in southern Italy, those Italians, they push them out. They beat them up, they absorb them, or they kill them. They kill them, they absorb them, or they push them out. One of those three things. It's exactly what European settlers do in the New World to the Native Americans. You, you have one of three choices. We kill you, we absorb you, or we push you out. Now, in theory, the barbarian peoples could beat up the Greeks and push them out, but in Sicily and in Italy and in the Black Sea, that doesn't happen. They, they are able to create a, their cities, their independent cities, and then spread out from there into a Greek civilization. And so they push out these weaker barbarians in these marginal areas, southern Italy, uh, eastern Spain, the Black Sea region. And so Greek culture spreads. And with it comes Greek economics, because if I am in Sicily, what am I doing with all the food I'm making? Well, I'm, I'm keeping what I need to eat, but then I'm selling it. But now I'm in a city where everyone's producing more than they need. So I need to export. Well, where do I export? I export back to Greece. And I mostly export back to my home city because that's where I have aunties and I have cousins and I have homeboys back there. So I call them up and I say, hey, I've got two tons of uh, barley or wheat. Do you need it? And they say, yeah, because we're surrounded by mountains. We don't have enough food. So we negotiate a price. We put it on a boat. We send it out. They, they, they pay my dudes on the boat or they pay me if I'm on the boat. I hand them over the barley. They go off to market. They sell it for a profit. I go home. I've made a profit. Everybody's doing well. So, and that creates that connection. So these colonies have connections back to their home countries, their home cities. So we'll see this in, uh, in the Peloponnesian War, where Italy, southern Italy, is mostly connected to Sparta. Now, they're not necessarily Spartan colonies, but they're Peloponnesian colonies, so they're allied with the Spartans. And all of their economics, all of their trade is going back to either Sparta or friends of Sparta. Meanwhile, the Black Sea is populated by people who used to be from Athens or places allied to Athens. And so all of their economics, all of their trade is flowing to Athens. And so we see this, these connections, these ties that bind these far-flung places. 
In our next episode, here we are at 20 minutes. In our next episode, we are going to talk about what all of this poverty, what all of these mountains, what does it mean for war and the armed forces of a typical Greek city? Thank you. Thank you.